years old, the, we are parliament is the first general elections and the first parliament with a universal franchise was 1952. So we are parliament at 70. And I work, as you saw in the previous video, uh, my organization, we work with parliament and now with state legislatures. And when anybody asks me to come and talk about anything, I know only one topic, so I talk about that. If you ask me about anything else, I will somewhere put that connection to come back to this topic because I don't know anything else. <laughs> so you will only hear about parliament. But before we start about parliament, I have a question to the audience. Okay. Uh, so let me, and I am just going after someone who is a professor of modern history, but I will ask you this question. Just imagine the, think of the world in 1945, okay, as it was. World War II, somewhere in 1940s, 1945, World War II is ending, right? And if you think of that, think of Asia, Africa, large parts were under the rule of European colonial powers, right? I mean, China wasn't really, Thailand wasn't, but much of Asia, much of Africa was. 1947, we got rid of them. But by 19, somewhere about the early 60s, most of the countries had got independence, right? We also decided that we will be a democratic nation, 1952, first elections. Okay. Many other countries also took the democratic path at that time when they got out. Can you name any country other than India of some at least reasonable size which has stayed democratic since they got independence till now, which is anywhere between 50 to 70 years in that period, which did not have an army rule or a police rule? We didn't. We had a blip of 1975 Indira emergency, but emergency was followed by elections where there was a peaceful transition of power. She didn't call in the army in 1977. Okay. So, if you actually look at that, can you name a second country which has done this? Anyone? Guesses? You may not, I mean, perfectly fine to get, give a wrong answer. Israel, uh, I would say, okay, let me put a minimum size of one crore population. And let me put a size, size minimum because, I mean, Israel, and actually Israel won't qualify. Because, I mean, does it really give all its residents <coughs> a vote? No. I mean, uh, it's a stretch to call them a democracy. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka no. It has had Amidu several times. New Zealand? Uh, New Zealand was always independent. Right? I mean, they were not under colonial order. I mean, if at all, the whites took over, and they are still there. Japan was never under colonial. There is no question of them getting independent. Okay? There are, I mean, the answer is, if you put a benchmark of some minimum size, that is simple. I think we have to, I mean, among all the despondency that we hear all the time, one has to appreciate that we have done two major achievements, I didn't talk about the other, which is that if you actually, I mean, I didn't put in those slides because I, otherwise I will go on till 7 p.m. or something. Okay. But uh, there is a lot of literature about practically every political scientist, every observer in the 1950s globally saying that India is not a nation. India is an unnatural country. <coughs> uh, the concept of a nation in the European sense is one language, one religion, one ethnicity. I mean, look at any of the European countries, largely one language, right? I mean, largely one religion. Uh, even when India, when partition happened, the other part, the Pakistan of those days, could not manage two languages. Really, I mean, just speak on that. We have stayed together, and I would actually argue, become stronger as a nation because my other usual question which I started with, how many of you think you are a Maharashtrian, a Bengali, a 
come in like Punjabi, most people raise their hand, but when I ask, how many of you think of yourself as an Indian? Most people, most of us do believe they are Indians. So we have achieved the fact that we think this is a country and we have also stayed as a democracy. And my argument is that at the core of our being a democracy, and I would say even to stay together as a country, has been, the democracy has been actually core to our having stayed as a country because it gives a lot of escape. I mean, it's like a pressure cooker where you have that escape vent, right? So democracy provides that and it has actually helped the state with this. And of course it has helped uh, us progress in several ways. And at the heart of our democracy, what is the institution? Parliament. And as anyone who has studied any uh, the development of countries would say that institutions matter. Institutions hold society together. Look at the recent elections of the United States. Their institutions held. Okay. For all that criticism that happened when President Trump claimed that the elections were not fair and it went to the Senate to be counted, the Senate did actually honor the what the people said. It held. The Supreme Court held. So institutions kept that country together. And when institutions fail, countries are in and societies are in. And parliament is at the core of the institution. Uh, it's the core institution. And from now on, when I'm talking about parliament on many ways, also think of, I mean, we are a large country. I mean, we are, after China, the second largest in terms of population, and China, of course, is not a democracy. Uh, so each of our states is as large. Most, many of our states are larger than any European country. I mean, the largest European country by population is Germany, eight and a half crore population. Maharashtra is, I think, 12 and a half. Bihar is 12. Let's not talk about Uttar Pradesh. It's, I mean, it, last time I saw it was 22. That was a year ago. Now it must be 24. I mean, I don't know. So it's, so we are really, really large. So when we talk about them, we should also talk, think about state legislatures because they are as important in our context as parliament is. Again, a few questions. Because my worry was Sunday afternoon, if I don't ask questions, it will be that. Okay. Uh, I have three questions. I'll tell you the three questions, then I'll take one by one. It'll be multiple choice. Okay. First question, if we track the evolution of parliament, first Lok Sabha, 1952 election, 17th Lok Sabha, 2019 election. Over this period, 17 looks over, the trend lines we are talking about, is parliament getting younger or is it getting older? And let me define that. Lok Sabha, any, any idea what's the minimum age to become a member of Lok Sabha? 25. 25? Okay, so let's call 25 to 40 as young MPs. Let's define young MPs as 25 to 40. Is the proportion of young MPs, that's 25 to 40 divided by the total number of MPs, is that proportion going up or down? Okay. Those who are saying going up, raise your hands. Okay. Those who are saying going down. Okay. Roughly a time. Okay. Second question. Women, and we talked a lot about that. Okay. Is the proportion of women in Lok Sabha going up or down? Okay. Going up, raise your hands. Ah, most people say that. Going down, raise your hand. Okay. Third question. Are our MPs educated? Because that's this whole thing. Okay. So I will actually give you three choices and I'll define educated. Okay. Anyone who has some bachelor's degree, undergrad degree, we'll call it educated. Call them educated. You should have one college degree at least. Okay. What proportion of parliament, parliamentarians, MPs today have a college degree? Okay. Three choices. 
I am going to give you 0 to 40, 40 to 70, and greater than 70 percent. Okay. 0 to 40 percent have a college degree, less than 40 percent. 60 40 to 70 have a college degree. Most people, more than 70% have a quality. Very few have. Okay, let's look at the answer. Okay, it's actually getting older. If you see the lowest line point, uh, it's 25 to 40, and that trend line is coming down. So, parliament is actually getting older. And interesting one is look at the top red one, that is people above the age of 70. Okay. Uh, that's going up. And I mean, look at even what's happening in our politics. Okay. Our Prime Minister is in his 70s. Okay. There is a, going to be a Congress election. A sprightly young person in his 60s is going to be a change maker against an old establishment person who is turned 80 in the Congress party. Okay. The BJP is a 72 year old man who is effectively the Prime Minister. Uh, education levels. Okay. About, if you look at that, the bottom segment is the people who do not have a college degree. Okay. That's about 20 to 25 percent. More than 75 percent have a college degree, including a reasonable number at the top, uh, with about 8, 9 percent, close to 10 percent, who actually have a PhD. And that yellow plus that is people who have a second college degree at least. So parliament, and my usual thing when I say people say, Achha, kaha se degree liya pata nahi kharida hoga. Well, you look at the actual thing. If you look at where they have got, you will see, okay, this is a decent degree. I am Raipur will call them for an interview based on that if they have the cat marks and all that. Okay. It, 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 most of the degrees will qualify for you. Parliament. Women, slowly, slowly increasing. Slowly, slowly, we are at 14 percent now for a 5 percent in the first world And the women's reservation bill of 33 percent and women's share, let's say 50 percent, half off. We will reach that somewhere in the 24th, 25th century. We'll be there. We will be there. Okay. So it's still a very, very slow progress. Okay. Another interesting data point I didn't ask you is this is a comparison between the first Lok Sabha and the current Lok Sabha. Okay. What is the self-declared profession? This is based on what they have declared themselves. Okay. And the totals will be more than 100 because some people declare more than one. Okay. I mean, you might be doing two things, right? So, so if you see, for me, the very interesting is the top one. Today, more than a third of them say that their primary occupation is political and social service, which is their full-time politicians. But look at the first Lok Sabha. This was the Lok Sabha of the independent movement. Okay. They didn't say that was their profession. They probably said, I mean, my guess, I don't, I had only the Consolidated number for the first Lok Sabha in a publication. I don't know individual declarations there. It was a Lok Sabha publication. Uh, but my, I'm guessing that somebody like Jawaharlal Nehru said he's a lawyer. He didn't say he's a political worker. That's my guess based on this. But it's very interesting that the percentage of lawyers has dipped. The percentage of politicians has gone up. Percentage of business and agriculture has also gone up. Agriculture may be something to do with the fact that we don't tax agriculture. I don't know, but that is not. Okay, why this was just so that we get an idea about what today's parliament looks like. Why should we be bothered about parliament? What does parliament do? Okay. At least, it does three extremely important functions. Okay. We all have to obey certain laws in India. Every law that we have to obey has to be passed either by parliament or in case it's a state subject or a concurrent subject by your state legislature. So parliament makes laws. Okay. Extremely important function. Nobody else can make laws. Okay. Second very important function. 
and I would say even more important than the first, is Parliament is expected to hold the government of a day to account for all its actions on a daily basis. So, we are a democracy, a parliamentary democracy. What that essentially means is that we elect our MPs, our MPs elect our Prime Minister or MLAs elect our Chief Minister and that Prime Minister or Chief Minister choose a certain set of their colleagues as the cabinet and that cabinet takes executive decisions but finally they have to be accountable to us citizens and the way they are accountable to us is they are accountable to our representatives in parliament or in the state assembly. I mean that's the conceptual thing. And for that, parliament has to function in a way that they are held accountable. And parliament has its own mechanisms. For example, the question R is primarily designed for that. And there are various other motions or the discussions that the government has to respond. And of course, the nuclear option of a no confidence vote is always there. I mean, that's a final accountability. Third, very important function. Okay, lots of students here. How many of you pay taxes? How many of you pay taxes? Not everyone. Okay. I mean, the government is taking some money from you there also. Okay. They don't have. Okay, okay. I don't know. I don't know whether, whether because education is not exempt, but there may be exceptions here. Okay, uh, so can the government can the government impose taxes on its own initiative? No, every tax. In fact, the constitution says that a tax may be imposed only by law. So every tax has to be passed and approved by the legislature. On the flip side, when the tax money comes in, the government cannot spend a rupee of it unless that has been sanctioned by the respective legislature. So there's a complete control of government finances by the legislature. So three important roles, making laws, holding the government accountable, ensuring financial uh, control of the government and <coughs> that part. And of course, represent being in all this representing us. In our way. And of course, parliament specifically has one more function, which is any change to the constitution of India, it has is the constituent body which. Okay. So Parliament has an extremely important role. And just to give you a couple of examples, okay. One, sometimes you will see that a very minor change can have large scale effects. And my favorite example <coughs> is this one. Okay. Everyone knows what a bamboo is. Right? Everyone has seen a bamboo tree, grass, what? Is it a tree or is it grass? Grass. Well, today it is grass. Five years or six years ago it was a tree. Okay. So, and why is this important? Under the forest act, I can't cut a tree. I need permission to cut a tree. I can't cut grass. Okay. So, the forest act was amended a few years ago, I think about four or five years ago, during NDA 1 that I remember, so it was the last few years, uh, to specifically say, put an explanatory statement that bamboo is grass. Okay. Why is this important? There, is a, there are lots of bamboo products, especially in the northeast. And this changed the entire bamboo industry, just that one word. So parliament with just that three words or four words they added, actually has had major changes. I'll just give you some more examples. But before that, let's just see how well parliament has functioned so far. Okay. I have a few more graphs. Okay. Uh, minor error, don't look at the first point. It's not zero because I should have started the point one year ahead. But <coughs> This is the number of days that Lok Sabha meets, which is a green line, and Rajya Sabha meets, which is the red line, per year. 
this is annual data. The number of days have met every year, going up to 2021, because obviously this year we have had the full year here. And you can see yes, that there is a downward trend, especially look at the first two decades. Lok Sabha used to meet more than, I mean, 100 days, you very often 120, 125 days. Now we are lucky if they meet 70. Okay. So, parliament is not meeting. <laughs> and when they meet, they create ruckus and they jump very often. So, so this is adjusted for the fact that they sit late, they sometimes sit on a Saturday. It's adjusted for that. It means that this is each Lok Sabha, number of hours they had for discussion. Of course, there are some stars at the bottom because they are not exactly comparable. For example, the fourth Lok Sabha, the sixth Lok Sabha were shorter ones, fifth was the Emergency Lok Sabha went to six year Lok Sabha. And some of the anything which has a star means it's not a full Lok Sabha, it's slightly different. Uh, less than five years. But even if you see the first one, two, three full Lok Sabha and the last four Lok Sabhas, 13 to 16, which are full Lok Sabhas, you can clearly see that various. We used to sit up more than 3,000, close to three and a half thousand hours, and now we are sitting about 1500, so less than half the time that we are doing. And I would contend that India today is way more complex. Our issues are more complex. There's a lot of technology, there's a lot of tech. I mean, you need, I mean, you, for example, the sec first or second Lok Sabha would not have had to think about how do you auction telecom spectrum, right? Not an issue. Today, you have many, many more technical issues which Parliament needs to do, and that's the problem. Okay. And because we are sitting less, they are passing bills without much discussion. Okay. So, 17 is slightly better, which is the current looks about till now. But look at 15th and 16th, uh, especially 15th, they passed about a quarter of the bill with no discussion, which is less than 30 minutes. Okay. It's improved slightly, but we are again back to a quarter of the bills without any discussion in the current looks about. And there is also one more very important instrument that parliament uses, which is called standing committees. And the importance of standing committees cannot be overstated. They are extremely important. What do they do? So every MP who is not a minister, because ministers are part of the government, part of the executive, every MP is part of at least a standing committee. There we have 24 departmentally related standing committees each looking at a set of ministries. So for example, there's a standing committee of finance, which will look at finance, corporate affairs, and related things. Uh, so when a bill is introduced, it may be referred to a standing committee for closer inspection. And the idea is that parliamentarians, 500 of them in Lok Sabha and 200, so 700 of them, they won't have the time to look at every bill in as much detail as a smaller subcommittee can. And they won't have the time to interact or forum to interact with experts. So standing committees call in experts when a bill is introduced, engage with experts, understand the issues, and come out with a report. And these committees are all party committees. Every Each committee has 31 members, 21 from Lok Sabha and 10 from Nazi Sabha. And we have seen, and I'll give you a couple of examples of when committees function well, they actually do a remarkably good job. But what we are seeing is fewer and fewer bills are being referred to standing committees. Okay. In fact, the current Lok Sabha, it's less than 10% of the bills are going to standing committees. So we are actually not using an extremely useful purpose. Okay. Budgets, we discussed that budgets are important. The union budget is more than 30 lakh crore. Okay. That sort of money, not without discussion, is being passed. We have reduced the number of confidence motions, adjournment motions. I won't go into that, but uh, again, an important parliament instrument to show, to essentially, to rebuke the government on some things. So, even discussions on that, we are not going. These are not ones which are passed, these are discussions about. Okay. Come to the state legislatures. Okay. There are a number of days. Last year, 2021, how many days did they say? Okay. 
look at where you are now. This is good. 20 days. 20 days is less than the number of working days in the month of October. This is what they did in the whole year. Right? So, and the best is Kerala, and that's 61. The average is 21. Okay. And, again, they are introducing bills, passing them the same day or the next day. Uh, so, take the example of GST. Was it a big, big uh, change? I am not using, deliberately not using the word reform because then connotations come good, bad, right? Was it a big change from the previous system? Yes, huge. It is complex. Okay. I'll tell you one example. I'll give you a question again. And to say, everyone has, I mean, I was here and I found that in your chota store next to that lady who makes those brilliant parathas. Okay, there is that store. You do get, huh? Ha, next we have. Next to that, there is a store where you do buy, you get Kit Kat. Everyone, everyone knows what a Kit Kat is, right? You know what's a Kit Kat? Yes, sir. Everyone has had a Kit Kat? Do you know what it is? I'm going to give you two choices, A or B. Okay. Is it chocolate with a biscuit inside? No. Or is it biscuit? Yes. So it went up, up, up. Nestle was claiming one, which I don't remember. I think biscuit was cheaper, so. Uh, chocolate was more expensive. So Nestle claimed it was biscuit and the excise department claimed it was chocolate and they were fighting and it went all the way up. It's a vegetable. Because the United States Supreme Court said it's a vegetable. Because there are different tax rates. Okay, lots of examples. Even in the new GST there are lots of examples where there is a problem. The idea of GST was to actually, the idea which has not been implemented properly, it was that you actually get rid of, other than the fact that it's a value added, value added is a huge thing, but you also have a national common rate across, so that you can actually carry forward input rate across states. You don't have those trucks now stationed in the border of every state crossing, so your logistics are much faster, we talked about efficiency, GST is definitely that, so GST has done a bunch of things. It's not easy to do. Why is it not easy? The taxes that it subsumed included for the center it's the excise duty on manufacturing and for states it was the sales tax okay and the reason gst became important is i'll just give you an example let's take simple numbers okay let's assume excise duty is 10 percent and sales tax is 10 percent okay. earlier let's say a product is made at the end of manufacturing it's worth 100 rupees add excise 10 percent 110 then it goes through various channels and it's sold for let's say 120. That, that 120 includes 10 rupees for the channel length uh, profit margin there because that channel is bought in 110. Again 10 percent on that is the sales tax. So you'll add 12 on 120 is 132. So you actually put 10 of tax and 12 of tax, 22 as tax. Whereas the value added was 10 and 10, so it should have been 20. So there's a tax on tax getting built up. You are paying sales tax on the excise. And the GST actually removes that and it makes a uniform system. But now, will the center give up the excise duty? No. Will the state give up the sales tax? No. So you need to create a system. Under the constitution, you have three lists. You have the state list, states, sales tax comes, said union list, excise comes, they are concurrent where, let's say even GST, where do we put? We can't put in union, states will say no. We can't put in state, central will say no. We can't put in concurrent because in concurrent <coughs> list, if there is a uh, articles in the constitution. Now, the constitution, article 368, which is about amending the constitution, it says that certain types of amendments require ratification of at least 15 percent of states which meant 15 states at that time we had 29 including Telangana and JNK okay it was a state so we needed 15 states to say yes okay which means you have to get them on board they they will not go on board unless they are agreeable to this so that had to be done process started because they were manufacturing states will be compensated for that and that 
was agreeable, it got ratified, and finally, so it was a process which took over 10 years. Advantage with that, of course, is you have got everybody on board. Other important ones, like insolvency code, okay, huge amount of vested interest. Why would any promoter? I mean, we have had promoters defaulting, defaulting, then bailed out, banks bailed out. Same promoter has defaulted multiple times in the way. IBC has, in a way, blocked that to some extent. So it's going against vested interest. Managed to went to a parliamentary committee. They actually went through it, made several important changes, and it has also been amended several times. So parliament, when it functions well, functions really well. Now I'll say that there are certain structural reasons which we need to address, other than the fact that they need to meet more often and committees need to work. Committees work really well because they are not partisan bodies. You don't have to posture in front of a TV camera, there's no TV there, so that you're actually talking to your electorate. So committees work well. Okay. We need to get them working better. But I would actually postulate there are three important things. I mean, there are many, but I'm actually highlighting three that I would like to change. Okay. One, and I think very important, is the strange creature we have created in 1985 called the anti-defection law, which is considered to the bar. What, is, what does that say? I mean, all of you would have heard of it. It essentially says that if an MP on any vote in parliament, okay, if the party tells the MP to vote in a particular manner, either yes or no or abstain, and the MP does not follow those directions, the MP is kicked out of parliament of state legislature, not out of just the party, but out, but disqualified and there will be by elections. Okay. Incidentally, no other mature democracy has this. Okay. What has this done? This has, I would say, completely taken away parliament's powers of everything. Okay, I'm making a very strong statement and I'll explain why. The government of the day is accountable to parliament. Parliament is accountable to us. Right? And when you say accountable to parliament, accountable to the members of parliament who are members at that time regardless of the party. They are accountable to every member who is not a part of the executive, which means in today's world, other than the people who are in the cabinet, the current government is accountable to every BJP MP also. Okay. It is not on party, I mean, they are equally private members. And they are in turn accountable to us because we can kick them out after every five years, 2024, they will not come to us for a, okay, please vote us back. And okay. now, what does that mean? It means that let's say there is a bill that the government has introduced in parliament. We want every MP to actually look at the bill, understand the issues, understand the nuances, how it affects people how it affects their own beliefs and take a decision on are they going to support or not. Then they do all this and then the party boss says you have to vote yes. They have to vote yes. So they have taken away the entire picture of an MP as a thinking person. And this was completely against the concept of parliament. There are two broad ways of thinking about parliament. Okay. And this is their basic political theory. One is that an MP is a trustee. This is the book version, which means that we have voted a person. That person acts in our interest, but uses that person's own judgment on what is good for the country, what is good for the people. That's a trustee model. Think of that as a doctor. You go to a doctor with an ailment. You expect the doctor to look at you and decide what will work for you and what is good for you. That is a trustee model. The second is called the delegate model, which is they are your delegates, they are your representatives, you tell them what they are supposed to do and they are supposed to do that. And they are accountability to us also. Because when the MP comes and I ask the MP, and you have all seen US elections, I am sure, which is, nice, which is good TV. So when Biden went, we will ask him, why did he vote in such a way or let's say in Iraq or whatever when he was a senator. Well, if I ask my MP, 
there would be an easy answer. I didn't have a choice, the party told me. Right? I mean, uh, I don't have, unless I would have been kicked out of parliament. So I had no choice. So you have taken out the accountability of the AMP trust. Connected to that is my second thing, which is the idea of recorded votes. Okay. I don't even know how the MP vote. Okay. And the reason is this. Typically in most votes, the way the Indian system works is, the speaker puts a vote, puts an issue to vote, and says, all those in favor say aye. Okay. All those against say no. Okay. The eyes have it because I'm hearing a louder voice. Okay. And according to the rule book, any MP can challenge that and say, I want a division. Division means I want a recorded vote. And on which a recorded vote has to be taken is what the rule book says. Okay. Less than 10% of votes are on, are on a recorded vote basis. So we don't even know, forget which way the MP voted. Like I live in New Delhi. Okay. My MP is Ms. Lakey. I don't know, forget the fact whether which way she voted, even whether she was present. Because all that the record book says is that the vote was defeated or the vote was won. Okay. 